Good evening, folks. I'm Jeff Barn, president of the college, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to my Ed's Creativity Series. I would like to thank the Bert L. and Patricia F. Steiglider Charitable Trust and individual donors for supporting my Ed's Creativity Series. I'd also like to thank Dale Scheidler, our 2D, 4D design chair, who's been instrumental in bringing Michael Delgadio back to my Ed. Michael is a 2001 Communication Design alumnus and the User Experience or UX Design Lead at Google. You all know that, that's why you're here tonight. Um, so, technology and creativity are increasingly becoming intertwined. At MyEd, our growing student body uses technology and in art and design making every day and in unexpected ways. Our new Innovation Center links companies and nonprofits with students who apply emerging technology and disruptive thinking to real world projects. The career opportunities we prepare students for, like user experience design, are part of the reason why, according to Money Magazine, Maya is among the top three art and design colleges nationwide for helping students from low income backgrounds secure upper middle class jobs. We are thrilled to have Michael Delgadio here with us. At Google, he leads user experience teams for Android TV and the Internet of Things. His teams develop strategy and design for Google's new and emerging products. Prior to being at Google, uh, Michael was creative director at Frog Design New York, where he reinvented innovation services and worked on products, design systems, and user interface for GE, Verizon, the United Nations, and Ernst & Young. He holds multiple design patents and speaks on design and technology at conferences worldwide. In addition to his degree from MIAD, he has a graduate degree from New York University's Interactive Telecommunications Program. Please join me in welcoming Michael Delgadio back to MIAD. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Maya, for having me. Uh, this is an important talk for me, uh, coming back to the school uh, after being gone for so many years. Uh, we're going to try out some new material and try to weave together a nice uh, narrative arc that combines my perspective around what I feel uh, is important to uh, design now and how that fits into my, my story. So living at the intersection of people and technology, uh, as you'll see in, in the as you'll see throughout the course of this presentation, uh, the consistent theme is that I always try to bring that intersection of people and technology to the forefront in every product that we need to be creating. <laughs> there we go. So tomorrow's products, uh, it's my belief that they require the seamless adaption uh, as we embrace the connected uh, world. And so, I think that what you'll notice is that I've moved from communication design, um, worked with product designers, but there's always been this thread. And as technology has become more embedded in the products that we create, it's important that they don't become more complex. And so that's what I really mean by seamless um, adoption, adaptation. And so fundamentally, there's two things going on here. Right? Or there's two, two things I'm going to talk about. There's humans, right? So we're all humans, we're all people. And there's technology. And between those two things uh, is an object, right? And so whether that object is a screwdriver or a gaming interface or a phone, there's fundamentally the scene between you and the thing that you're using. And that thing is an interface. And as interface designers, we get to craft that narrative and that experience that connects people uh, to technology. And we call that craft UX, or user experience. And I think that this is uh, one of the greatest things that we can be doing right now because ultimately what we get to do is make technology easier for people to use and invent new ways for people to use those, those products. And so, some of you are probably more familiar with UX and assuming that students, you know, I've been talking to people as I've been here, uh, are obviously 
interested in this topic. And I think that you know, going back to when I was a student here, UX wasn't actually a thing, right? We talked about design and uh, we talked about uh, the web, but user experience interaction design has really been an evolving field. And now today more than ever, there are more roles, more jobs, um, more specific things that designers can do to help craft that experience that is again sitting between people and the products um, that we use. So when people talk to me about what I do at Google or what user experience is or, or what I do, I, I tell them that I try to make technology easy to use. Right? So it's lots of, in lots of times, in lots of cases, there's a product or an idea or an engineer will have uh, an invention. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the easiest thing for people to approach. And um, you know, as we move throughout the world, we move throughout the lives, we build these mental models of how we expect things to, to work. Um, we expect a door to open a certain way, right? There's visual signifiers and clues um, throughout the world that we have expectations of what products should do for us. And when we start to introduce technology into the mix, it, it changes our expectation of what that is. And so fundamentally as a UX designer, what I try to do is make that approachable and make new technology easy to use for people so that they can also benefit from uh, that technology in their lives. Uh, another way that I like to talk about user experience is the art and science of making products that people love. So another aspect that you'll see in the work is that as designers, we try to build empathy for our end users and try to understand what is it like from that person's perspective who's trying to use your product, right? So as a designer, you may not really understand what it's like for that person driving in the car who's trying to um, you know, get navigation going on their app because they're thinking about um, things that may not have to do with driving, um, things that may be tangential to um, the driving experience, like music is playing. Um, so building empathy will really help us connect the product to people. Uh, also, solving problems um, for those people. So talk briefly about empathy, but also thinking about the pain points that people may have as they try to go through your product experience, focusing on those pain points, and then designing solutions that ultimately meet those needs. So again, UX, I see it as that point where we connect humans, us humans, people uh, with, with technology. But there's, there's a problem. Uh, humans are weird, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're not really rational creatures. Uh, like, look at this guy. He's standing on a flaming jet ski in, in the desert. Um, so this was from Burning Man in 2017. I wasn't there. This is a picture that I got on the internet. Uh, but I think it really exemplifies this, this notion that we're not always rational creatures. We don't always do the things that we expect people to do. Um, we're emotional. Uh, we like to have tomato fights. Uh, and, and my point is that you know, we're emotional, irrational, whimsical, curious, devious. Like we have all these things that this is what makes us human, right? And we need to understand these things if, if we're gonna make technology connect to the people. There we go. And uh, technology that fails to connect to humans is just happening in a vacuum, right? And so building technology for technology's sake that doesn't connect to humans, that doesn't understand the emotional value and what it is that we're trying to achieve, is just happening by itself and it's not really connecting to anybody. And um, that makes me sad. And so I really want you know, us as a design community to be able to create things that people value, that people love, that people, that improves their lives. And so let's, let's take a few, look at a few examples. Let's click our show calendar. Uh, so, so this is a product I work on, this is Android Things, I'll come back and talk about the significance of this product later, but 
when, when you look at technology, that's, that's all it is, right? It's just a circuit board that's sitting there without any purpose yet, right? And so as designers, it's our imperative to really figure out how to give that technology a purpose, how to connect that to the people um, who we're making it for. Uh, this is an example from, from CES that I feel like technology happening in a vacuum, TVO, 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 blockchain, 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 you're like, what, what does this do, right? Like, who, who, who is this technology being made for? It's just really hard to tell. Um, here's, here's another example. Uh, this is apparently, uh, this is another, um, uh, another shot from CES, um, the world's first smart sofa. <laughs> Plays YouTube or something, I'm not sure. So, so again, I, I feel like they're failing to connect, connect the dots here, right? It's like, it's a smart sofa, but like, what, what? I, I think that it actually has ground effects, I'm not sure, just led by the blue on the guy's shoe, I'm not, I don't know. But again, they're not thinking about this from, from the perspective of what is this couch or the smart sofa actually going to do for people? And how can you communicate that to the people who you're trying to sell the couch to? Right? What's it going to do? And so um, I, 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 was, I was thinking about examples of, of how you know, what we do at Google does connect to, to people. And um, it, it occurred to me that even at Google, when we're creating the most advanced AI algorithm ever created, um, we're using that to play games. And to me, there's something really interesting there because we're not crafting AI, but we are doing a lot of, a lot of broad variety of things with AI. But again, the AlphaGo team was really tasked with figuring out how they could create, how they could create a system uh, that would play uh, Go, which is a very complicated game, against the world's best Go player. And it's, it's a game. And to me, there's something really interesting there because we're not trying to all of a sudden go do this very functional thing. We're not setting the AI out um, to go solve uh, you know, all these problems of humanity, but rather, like, let's see if we can solve this game. And a game is just something that we play between two people. And uh, the other thing that I thought was, was really relevant about this photo is um, this is uh, Lee Sedol uh, losing. Right, and so back to that that emotional point, right? Like he is crushed, right? Like he is the world's best Go player, and he just lost to a computer. And you can just see this emotion in his face, which is that you know he's built up his career to this point where you know it's just been completely taken away by the, by the computer, and the, the computer like has no reaction, right? The computer's just going to keep computing, right? But he is, he is like absolutely like devastated. And so humans have emotions, and it makes them very finicky uh, and hard to predict exactly what they're going to do. And, uh, and we get to, uh, to deal with that. Go. So designers uh, and UX <laughs> profession, what we really must do is make technology relatable by connecting it to the purpose and the motivation of the people who are using that. So again, look, thinking about humans, thinking about technology, and having user experience um, be that center or that focal point um, that we can concentrate on to really think about how we can bring humans together with technology. So every, everyone has a story, and I think that this is important, and I was thinking about you know, how I could uh, you know, weave my career and my narrative art kind of through this, this talk for, for you all at my ed. And, uh, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about my story, how I got here, uh, some of the experiences that I've had along the way, and how we can again think about how that relates to um, the creation of new product experiences. And so starting off at Maya, um, as mentioned uh, in the introduction, and then went on to, to NYU to think about, um, to study uh, interactive telecommunications and really um, building on that design foundation and overlaying more technology onto it. Um, then went on to Frog and, and Google. And I think that you know, thinking about what I took away from each stage in that career, um, it really built from design to technology to innovation to product at scale. And uh, I'll dig into that a little bit more. But I think that each one of these things offered something very unique that enabled me to get to that next level. Um, but before all that, before I got to uh, my ad, 
uh, there was a game called Pitfall. And in 1984, uh, when I was just a, a child, uh, I really wanted to play this game. <laughs> and my mom had a laptop uh, that, that ran DOS. And uh, in order to play um, Pitfall, uh, I had to learn how to figure out how to navigate DOS. And uh, it, it was an interesting thing because uh, it was really my first introduction to really figuring out like how does a computer work and how can I get that computer to do this thing that I want it to do for me. Um, but again, it was all just because I wanted to play this game. And so uh, my mom had this perspective that if I wanted to play that game, I needed to learn how to use DOS. And uh, she really pushed me to think about how I could learn how to program games and how I could take that first step towards, again, learning how technology works. Uh, in high school, there was a number of things that were happening, I think. Uh, 1996 Internet Explorer is amazing. <laughs> and so the internet was, was just, just, uh, just arriving. And I was interested in it. And at my high school, they had a program called Graduation Challenge. And Graduation Challenge, what that meant for students was that you had to pick a topic, you had to work with somebody in the community, uh, not really as an internship, but just as like a mentorship. You had to build something or make something. Like you had to have an artifact that you actually made. And then you had to um, present that to the school. And uh, I picked websites. Uh, I worked with uh, someone who was making websites. But again, I think that this, 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 this brought me to Maya at an interesting time because I was interested in the web. And then getting to Maya, I was able to overlay design onto that, that early narrative. And then the internet was amazing. Yeah, Maya, here we go. So I know there's a couple of teachers in the, in the audience, and I am going to uh, just call out uh, or embarrass a few of you, hopefully. So when I, when I was thinking about this presentation uh, and just how to bring this together into um, you know, my story to share with you, uh, I thought about a few moments that really stood out to me as just, you know, you probably all have these too, where somebody says something to you in critique or uh, you have a conversation with a teacher and it just kind of sticks with you in this in this this way that influences like the rest of what what you do um, and so there's there's a couple of them I can't I can't pick them all out but uh, sweating the details um, this is a great idea but the misalignment is very distracting and so you know in, in, in Dale's class you know I see a few heads shaking or, yeah yeah it's happening and so, you know, just, just being very in tune with making sure that things are um, accurate and they're lining up. I still struggle with this every day, by the way. Uh, but it, it also is one of these things that, you know, getting to fraud, um, we really needed to make sure that the things that we were doing, and, and this is true of Google too, were really, really on point for the clients that we were delivering for. Uh, maybe go back. Uh, so in, in, Bob's, in Bob's class, uh, I did take some interior architecture classes while I was here, and uh, one of the things that we, we did was uh, we did this reading room for an urban dweller project, and you know, he said to me, this design is conceptually powerful, and it occurred to me at that time that I could really use metaphor um, as an idea to embody a greater concept in, in the design, and I think that that was kind of this pivotal moment for me where you know, I was thinking about the work that we were doing um, in his class and how that not only related to interior architecture, but how I could transfer that to um, communication design, web design, and ultimately UX. Uh, so Kim, she, she's no longer here, uh, but I think that one of the things that she talked to me about was getting across the finish line. And she said to me, you know, you, it seems like you have a really hard time getting across the finish line. You know, you have your idea and you get it there, and then you're kind of like, yeah, it's done. It's, there you go. And this has kind of stuck with me in a, in a really meaningful way, too, because looking at points further in my career, it became really obvious that you're never done, ever. <laughs> right? It's like you, you ship the work, you give it to the client, but then you're doing something. Um, a few months later, they're back, you're, you're iterating it on again, and at Google, 
we work on, on after, even after we launch the product, we're iterating on it, right? We're not done, we're still making it better. And so even though you think you crossed that finish line, it's like, guess what? That finish line just moved again and you can get across it. You gotta keep getting across it, right? You gotta finish strong and you gotta keep going. And so again, it's, it's hard to summarize um, you know, everything that I took away from, from my ad in a few slides, but you know, those were kind of the things that were top of mind. I think that at a macro level, uh, there are things that um, I learned, like problem solving, that I hope you all are, are learning in the curriculum here um, now, that are highly applicable, right? So really building on that core foundation of design understanding so that you know that you can take on any problem that comes your way. Um, critical thinking. I know that there's a deep liberal studies um, program here that you all, you all are involved in. Um, that helps develop those critical thinking skills, not just in how you think about your writing, but how that applies to the problems you're solving uh, in design. Uh, and finally, collaboration. You know, one of the things that um, you will all realize once you graduate from here is that nothing is done by yourself. And um, for those of you who are working professionals in the community, you know this, but you have to learn to work with people. You know, it's one of the things that we look for uh, when we're hiring designers onto the team. It's like, can this person work with other people? You know, this idea that a designer is just sitting there dictating the end-to-end -end solution from top to bottom, from form to UI to marketing, it's, it, that doesn't happen, right? And so we have to learn to work with people. And that all starts, um, you know, here, uh, learning how to collaborate with your, with your fellow students. And uh, just to give you a, a kind of snapshot into the things that were enticing for me, so you gotta go back in time. There was no phones, there was no you know, watches. Uh, we were making CDs, right? We were super excited that you could make like an interactive CD and put music on it, and it was the coolest thing ever. Um, we had Macromedia Flash, which doesn't exist anymore. We had uh, Internet Explorers, like, it was very, very early stages of the web, right? That's kind of head shaking. Um, the, the interesting thing that I was thinking about, uh, <coughs> we were talking to Bonnie North earlier today, was uh, you know, Spotify just released like version 80, or something like that. Like it's, it's, you, you think about trying to do that on a CD, but like you used to have to like go get a CD, and like put it in the computer, and push it in, and run it, and like upgrade your Photoshop, and it was amazing. And just, just the world has changed so much to have online distribution of software, online connectivity, everything being connected to the cloud. And I think that you know, stepping back and thinking about kind of how slow things really moved, it's really staggering to look at like where we were then and what we're, what we're able to do, to do now. Uh, so, so NYU, uh, the program at NYU is called Interactive Telecommunications, and uh, ITP for short. And the Interactive Telecommunications program takes the perspective that we can, they can bring together uh, a diverse number of students ranging from theater to design to psychology and uh, give them the basic tools of technology to see how they can apply those to different mediums. And I think that it's a really interesting approach because you get a lot of creative solutions in terms of what you're able to do um, with those um, like with that material. I was talking to Ben about this, uh, about the innovation center that's being set up. And I, I think that there's a lot of the same objectives there where Maya is really trying to um, take that first step to say, you know, how can we introduce these, these technologies into um, the classroom, but not in a way that's really driving towards um, uh, a specific business application, but let's explore what that technology is like before, before we really understand it. And that's, that's an okay space to be in. Right, because it, it lets you understand what that medium is capable of, of doing for you as a designer, and what that medium is capable of doing uh, for your for your customers um, and for the products that you create. <coughs> and so I, I started to think about technology and, and products as an experience, um, and a little bit less as an object as, as we started to move into, into NYU. And so this was this was one of the more notable projects, which was um, which was a wearable camera. And uh, again, I go back in time a little bit, slightly before iPhone, um, there was Nokia phones, and you could program Python on them. 
And what we started doing was just making a timer that would snap off a photo and upload it to the web with your, your GPS locations. And there's, there's stuff like this out there. Um, Google has a wearable, little wearable camera. I think that as an exploration, it was very interesting for me because, I, again, I started to think about uh, technology as a means to really help define this experience over time. And so the other thing that I think that you'll see in the work is that um, experience over time uh, really helps people understand what that full range of problems are that you need to solve as a designer. So when we think about time overlaid onto the product problem, uh, you can begin to think about what is that full length of the user journey, right? How do they become aware of a product? What is the unboxing experience like? How do they set up the app? How do they connect the app? What does the product do? How do they service it? How do they resubscribe? And so it's, it's not just a static state where somebody picks up your product and uses it, where they pick up the app and use it. Right? They're, they're constantly coming back to it at different times and having these experiences that may change and shift over time. And we really need to think about time um, as a mechanism for how we can, again, understand those different product touch points. And so it's really that design is not the creation of artifacts. It's not grid systems. Design is not typography. Design is not color systems. Right? These, are all, these are all things that we use but rather, design is the process of crafting our relationship with technology. So again, thinking about that, that human technology reaction and that, that focal point of UX, really crafting that interface. Okay, frog. So frog design, uh, I know that the, the uh, there's, a lot of DID students are familiar with, with Frog, because Frog has uh, its roots in uh, industrial design. Uh, so I, I came to Frog uh, as an interaction designer, worked my way up, I eventually became creative director. I uh, got to work with a number of amazing clients like GE, Verizon, uh, and got involved with IoT. I'll take you a little bit through that, that narrative. Whoa. Here we go. So actually, I'm going to play this video. For those of you who are not familiar with Frog, this is going to be a good idea for what we do So the, the type of work that I was able to gain exposure to at, at, at Frog was, was really a wide range of both uh, industrial design, uh, branding, um, it's the BNY Allen work. Um, again, Frog got its, its start, uh, founder Herman Esslinger uh, came from Germany to work with Steve Jobs in the initial Apple computers. Uh, we do conceptual work like this over here for uh, Intel, who was really trying to uh, provide concepts and really inspire people for what they could do with the microprocessor, like their new microprocessor line in the retail space. And so we would do everything from you know concepts to products to um, web properties to branding. And I think that uh, for the students who end up going into consulting, it can give you a really broad range of um, experiences that can be really exciting. And so it was around this time that I, I started thinking about connected product experiences and um, 
the Internet of Things. Ah, wait, before that. I, I also started using um, mantras, or I like to think about kind of the role that I'm in and how mantras can play, play, a, play a role. And it occurred to me while I was working with various clients there that if I could just do these four things, that I could be successful, right? And so if I could create a pitch, um, sign the work with the client, uh, do the design work with my design team, and deliver that work, that I knew that that was what I needed to do to be successful. And uh, this really became my consulting mantra, where it's like, it's just like, pitch it, sign the work, do the design work, deliver it, right? And that was what was going to get me to the next level. And I think that mantras are important, and um, I think that it becomes like an easily repeatable phrase that you can go back to, that you can rely on to say, like, if I'm getting off track, what do I need to do next, right? I can do that next thing. And uh, it kind of gives you a good grounding that you can, you can always fall back on. And uh, I, I think, too, uh, there was this moment, um, you know, again, thinking about influential uh, people in my uh, career. Uh, Jay, you know, one, one day he came, he came over and we were doing, uh, you know, a review or a critique before bringing the work to the client. And, you know, he says to me, like, all you have is a bunch of screens. Right? Why, what are we telling the client that they need to do? And it, it really stuck with me because until that point, I really felt like I was interpreting the brief and then executing on that brief. And having a point of view and the, having a point of view that you can communicate to the clients and tell them what you think they should do as opposed to just saying, okay, here's the brief, I'm going to go do execute that brief. Um, is a big shift kind of in the mental model because in this case, clients are coming to Frog for professional advice on what they need to do. And they may think they, need, they know what they need to do, but that may not necessarily be the best thing or the thing that's in their best interest. And so having a point of view or a strong opinion about what you think the answer to the problem is, uh, is, is of tremendous value. I mentioned GE briefly. Uh, I ran the GE account for a number of years. Uh, I got to work on everything from GE Healthcare to, um, to GE Energy. This was a project that we did for GE Energy. It was looking at uh, digital management of the grid system. And so GE, when we were working with them, was at a really interesting kind of point in the evolution of GE as an organization because they were beginning to think about how they could create more business value on top of their existing manufacturing infrastructure. So for example, if they're manufacturing a wind turbine, right, you need to be able to get the data off of that wind turbine and then sell that data to um, the customers and make value out of that data so that they understand what's happening with the wind turbine when it needs to be replaced so that they can sell services in on top of that. And this is true in a lot of, a lot of the business areas that they work in, everything from, from aviation to healthcare. Um, all those systems are becoming sensorized, right? They're putting sensors into this industrial equipment and trying to understand how they can unlock value uh, in that industrial internet space. And again, thinking about people. So we, just, we don't just go and say, okay, here's your software. I'm going to go over here and make a great, a better UI for it. Um, we go and we, we talk to people, right? Like we talk to the actual people who are using the software that we're making that software for. We try to understand what it's like from their perspective um, so that we can craft better user experiences, better f user flows, better screens, better models for how the software can work with them. So this is uh, Jennifer Dunham sitting down with one of the control engineers. And she's trying to get them to sketch. A lot of people, if you talk to them, they don't like to draw. Um, so you know, we call this um, co-design or generative design. But again, we're trying to understand from the user's perspective how we can uh, create a better system for them. Um, we, we visit the spaces uh, that the software is being used, right? So we would go on site to better understand what is the context in which the software needs to um, exist or operate. And so you can see, you know, there's multiple monitors, they've got phones, um, they may be doing multitasking by being on the phone and having to look at something on the grid at the same time. And so it's things like that, talking to people, understanding their perspective. 
um, understanding the context in which something's used that ultimately can lead to solutions like this, where you can start to bring together communications infrastructure, grid, man grid monitoring and management, um, and work planning, um, all, into, all into one interface. And so this, this, this really got me thinking about uh, IoT and how GE was trying to monetize um, the work. And I saw at that time you know, a lot of sensors being tried to put into products. And again, just because you take technology and put it into a product doesn't necessarily mean that that technology is, or that product is more valuable. And I think that that's, that's the, the misconception, right? Where it's like, if I take my broom and I connect it to Wi-Fi, I have a connected broom. And, look, <laughs> who cares? Um, so you have to begin to think about, like, what is it about connected products that you can really use to kind of frame the conversation around increasing product value. And so the way that I started talking about it was using, um, using this model, where uh, connected products inherently have, um, they should have an immediate value, right? Like there should be an immediate value proposition for the user. It should do something faster for them. It should, that connectivity should help them get through some situation more effectively. And so in the case of um, uh, EasyPass, this is a uh, connect, like the EasyPass, you will find those things, like you put it in your car, helps you go through the, the toll gate faster, right? This is inherently an IoT product because it's, it's a connected toll system, right? We may not think about it like that, but that's what it is. And so it has, it has great immediate value for people because they can go through toll gates faster. You don't have to stop. Uh, it also has aggregate value. So one of the things that you may not realize is that a lot of the cities that use EasyPass or a uh, similar tagging system is that there are also sensors around the city that help monitor traffic, right? So for example, in New York City, they would use EasyPass uh, readers throughout the city to understand what are traffic patterns. So they wouldn't charge you anything, but they would also identify the tag, understand where you are, and help inform the traffic situation. And then finally, latent value, right? And so in this study, um, what they did is they looked at premature low birth weights um, around mothers who were living near toll plazas. And where EasyPass had been implemented, they saw um, more successful um, weights in birth. And so this is something, again, that you can only realize when you look at the data over time, right? And then this is one example of where this simple tag or this pass has an immediate value to the person who's using it. It has an aggregated value because we all get to benefit from using that data. And it has a latent value to society if you look to look at that data trend over time. Google, okay. So finally, coming to Google. Uh, so again, I, I worked at Frog. I was interested in these IoT uh, projects. Uh, Google, obviously, uh, was an intriguing place for me to want to go work. Uh, there was an opportunity to go work on the Android Things uh, team, which I did for, for a long time, uh, a number or about a year and a half, and then uh, recently I moved over to Android TV. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how, how that kind of came together. Um, just first, a brief brief history of Google and what we do there. Maybe. So one of the things that uh, is part of our core beliefs is uh, focus on the user and all else will follow. And so to, to me, I think that this is always aligned with what I believe is true for creating great products and creating great design is that you have to understand from the user's perspective, what is it that they're trying to do so that you can help align the product goals with, with the user goals. And so, Again, starting off as functional utility is, is kind of funny, pulling this together. It's like, we're really excited. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it was really just about getting those, those, top, those top search results to users quickly and getting that top one there to make sure that that was um, the most valuable search, search engine possible. Uh, this was, again, a little bit before my time, but Google didn't really start to think about design systems and creating um, consistency for the user experience across their multiple products 
Um, until 2011, this was the first design language system. This was Kennedy, this is pre-material. Uh, but this is what it started to look like with the Gmail redesign. But this was kind of the start of when people started to say, like, hmm, how can we create a more consistent user experience by using design systems to systematize the components, the grids, the hierarchy, the structure of the pages to bring it all together so that when you're using a Google product, you understand that it's a Google product. Uh, material, so material design uh, launched in 2014, so this was just around the time when, when I arrived. And this was a major overhaul, right? And this was a big push. And I know that, that some of you from speaking with you uh, in the classes earlier this week are familiar with material design. It's an open, open source design system where we provide uh, tools and templates for designers to hopefully make products that are easier to use by establishing um, grid systems, hierarchy, layout, that we know it's been tested and we know that it works. And uh, we use it internally and then we also give it away. And uh, I think that the rebrand in 2005 you know, signifies a lot of things. I think that you can see the Google logo turning into um, a microphone. Right? And so Google's really embarked on this. Um, uh, this challenge to figure out how we can bring ambient computing to the masses. And we've been doing that through the Google Assistant. And so you can see the Google logo you know, transforming into this mic, the listening state, and really signifying that there's more going on um, than, than just search. Uh, I'm going to play, play this video too. I think that uh, it highlights some of the, the diversity of work uh, that happens at Google. I think that a lot of people think that. I'll tell people about that. Look at Google. Now, what do you work on? A design system. They kind of pause for a second. What is there to design? There's a lot, a lot going on there. And uh, I, I think that, you know, it's a little bit of a long video, but I, I think that the, uh, the reason why I wanted to let it play was because I, I, it gives a good sense of just the breadth of work that's happening. Uh, everything from illustration to VR to AR to UI to hardware design, uh, services design, there's, there's a tremendous amount of, of design work that happens at, at Google. Uh, I mean, type, typography, type design, it's, it's a lot happening. So. 
So we talked about, um, you know, most people think of, uh, most people think about search, right? And so they're like, well, what do you, what do, you do there? Uh, and, but there's a lot of, there's a lot, of, a lot of mobile properties too, right? There's Google Calendar, there's Maps, uh, there's Chrome, um, just, just to name a few. So there's obviously like UI that, that happens. Uh, services, so Google Fi. So again, thinking about um, uh, how we can create service systems that is not just a tangible thing that you buy, but how can you design a system for a service that you need to communicate value to that somebody needs to consume, right? So Project Fi is um, a carrier, right? So it's like uh, Verizon or Sprint or a phone carrier, but it's an intangible thing, right? It's a service that you sign up for. Like how can you begin to think about um, what are the customer pain points in, in communicating value, acquiring that service, using that service um, without an actual uh, artifact or a uh, physical thing. And then finally, you know, over the last uh, three years that I've been there, we've moved into hardware, right? And so uh, it's, it's, it's easy math for me because we're on the Pixel 3, so I know that we've been making hardware for three years. And so you can see that you know, Google has moved from being a you know, web-based search engine into a much more diverse um, place where we're now offering um, hardware products, software products, services. Um, and it's, it's, it's an exciting time to be a designer there. Um, the self-driving car, Boomshots, Waymo, always comes up too. Um, they have a UX team as well that's, that's helping work on how you call the car, how do you get into the car, what happens if there's a problem in the vehicle, right? So there's all these kinds of things that UX needs to really think about how we can create better products um, for these new things that are being interjected um, into our lives and into society. And UX is involved um, across all of this. And the way that I think about it is um, there's three fundamental pillars to product creation. Um, there's engineering, uh, there's product management, and user experience. And I think that when you think about those three things, you really can form a more complete picture of the roles that are needed to make um, any of these things happen in a successful way. And so when we talk about UX uh, at Google, we really sit um, here within the technology org organization. And so you know, UX at Google is inclusive of um, roles ranging from interaction design, visual design, industrial design, um, sound design, UX writing. And so there's, there's a lot of different kinds of um, people and opportunities that are, that are happening there. I think that, you know, thinking about uh, where I was at Maya graduating, I mentioned this, you know, in the beginning, those kinds of things didn't exist. Right? Those kinds of roles uh, weren't actual opportunities that people could go and pursue. And so for me, kind of how this has expanded has been a really interesting um, uh, thing to observe because I never would have imagined that uh, UX and, and design, interaction design, would be embraced by so many companies um, as it is today. And so, so in things. So one of the, the first projects that I worked on uh, when I went to Google was a project uh, called Android Things. And so Android, as you know, is our, um, our mobile operating system that we use in handheld technology. And what Google is doing is looking at different product, product verticals where they can use that technology um, to create new products. So for example, they're looking at putting it into um, cars with Android Auto. Right, so they're thinking about that operating system and how it can be applied in different things. And so Android Things was really Google taking a look at how they could create an operating system for new connected products like speaker products, smart displays, and what my team was tasked, tasked with was um, working with our third party partners to help them adopt this new technology uh, and also figuring out how we could make this technology and this operating system more relatable um, for developers who are thinking about making products on top of that platform. And so you can see that it, it ranged everything from product or packaging design to um, uh, mobile use to web and everything in between. And so for example, we worked with LG to help them get this, this operating system into the platform. And here we were, we were, we're not thinking about the design of the form of this, this was really left LG. 
but really thinking about how the person's going to interact with the Google Assistant um, using the speaker interface on top. So there's some control systems on top, but again, we're trying to reduce that to the smallest amount so that it's a seamless experience, it is um, easily approachable, and that you can just talk to it. Uh, another one of our partners was Lenovo. Uh, so we, we worked with Lenovo to use Android things to create the smart display platform. And so um, with, with products like uh, Lenovo Smart Display and uh, the alarm clock that was just announced at CES, uh, we help them try to understand human factors. So for example, if you're creating an alarm clock, um, is it going to be really bright next to the bed when you wake up? Right? Is it going to wake you up in the middle of the night? Um, what are people's expectations around like that level of brightness? How do they expect this clock to interact? You kind of don't want it to be a full-fledged phone. You don't want to lie in bed and watch videos, really. So if you're trying to make a smart clock, like what does that actually mean, right? Like what does it need to do besides just be a clock that you can talk to? And so we help them figure out um, problems like that. And so this this really brought me to this idea of. Um, my leadership mantra, right? Which is, if I can plan, organize, inspire, and help my group execute, I really feel like that's what's going to drive me to be successful um, at the next level. And so, thinking about Android things, uh, we made a website, worked on the photo shoot, um, did all the creative direction for, for this work, uh, worked on the packaging, built all the packaging out, um, we had noticed that the engineering team was like assembling these on their desks and they had all these parts laid out. And so we started to think, well, like, couldn't we make a little useful stand instead of just having it just be lying there on the desk? Um, so that's what we started to do with the packaging assembly. And then for one of our uh, shows, uh, the Google I.O. event, developer event, uh, it's an annual event that we do to bring the Google development community together. Uh, we wanted to showcase the technology. And so what my team did was create a robotics application that showed how Android things could be used to really inspire um, and really think creatively about the application of that technology. And so what we did is we, we created a um, a flower garden, and you can see in the center of that flower, there's a little camera. And that camera is looking for people, um, whether they're smiling or whether they're frowning. And um, this is uh, Niat, one of the engineers on my team, who was uh, working actually on the smile detector. And he's testing out the flower, and so you can see when he smiles, um, the flower opens up, it gets happy. Uh, when he frowns, it closes in, it gets sad. And again, we weren't trying to commercialize like Google moving into the flower business. What we were trying to do was show you know, how you could use this technology to really think creatively about its application in new spaces. Uh, another way that we did that was through um, this, uh, we call Lantern. And so Lantern uh, is a DIY uh, projected AR system. And so we took uh, an Ikea lamp, and uh, we use Android Things and a Raspberry Pi to create a uh, projected AR. And so you can see the, the projector uh, has a camera in it. And so the cool thing that you can start to do with uh, a, a, a localized projection system in your environment is really start to think about you know, how you can project different pieces of information into the space to start to create new meaning out of those things. So what you're looking at here is uh, an experiment that we did that looked at projecting the current playing song from Wi-Fi onto a speaker, right? So thinking about how we can take this in and just show what the possibilities are uh, of the technology. Uh, this is another example that we did where we connected um, Lantern and the projection system uh, to your calendar, right? We thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could project that around a clock so that you could look at the clock and you could understand uh, where you're supposed to be. And again, this isn't in um, After Effects. We built this, we demoed it, we recorded it. And uh, it's also spatially aware, right? So as you flip the device uh, up, 
uh, and knows what angle it's going. And we always thought it would be cool to uh, have different channels um, and play different content so that it knew if it was pointing up, you could project uh, a star chart on the ceiling, uh, project your, your calendar on the, on the clock, things like that. And so we, we took this concept, uh, we brought it back to the team, and we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could take this one step further uh, and figure out if we could use QuickDraw within this LAMP um, at our I.O. conference. Uh, and so QuickDraw, for those of you who don't know, uh, is an online uh, game where uh, you're prompted with a word, and as you start drawing uh, what, that, what, you, what you see is the computer guessing what it thinks you're drawing. So for example, if you're prompted with the word sun and you start drawing a circle, it'll say like, I see a circle, right? And then as you get closer to the sun, it eventually recognizes as what you're doing is, is the sun. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool is it, instead of doing that in a website, if you could actually draw with a pen and have that same experience through a projected interface instead of having to draw uh, with a mouse. And so this is, this is what we did for, um, for the demonstration of this concept. And so you can see uh, Ji Young, she's one of the designers on my team who's working on this, demonstrating that she draws. You can start to see that the computer guesses. Eventually, it guesses right. Uh, we made a little QR code so that you could take this experience <coughs> with you. Uh, and the cool thing that um, you can see is that uh, as she scrolls up, you can get a, a little snippet of what the computer sees. And so the computer wasn't actually or isn't actually looking for a picture of a plant. It's actually using gestures and gesture recognition to understand what the gesture of that plant is. Right? So it's using handwriting and understanding the directionality of the movement of the pen to um, guess what it thinks that, that is. And we didn't start off you know, by just wanting to make this thing. We started off, how do you all start off? We started off by sketching and thinking about what are interesting concepts that we could do with this, with this projection idea. Uh, we didn't know exactly where we were going with the concepts of um, the clock. So you can see things like this where we thought it would be cool to make a little prototype. We don't know what it's going to do. Like maybe it will project information into the, onto your desk, something like that. Um, but we weren't sure. Um, and again, you guys are all familiar with the process of sketching, right? So sketching this out, trying to think about what is this form going to be like. Uh, this was the first kind of form model that we put all the components into. Start to see if they would fit before we could 3D print them. Uh, we didn't, again, just make a lamp. Um, we had to systematize what we wanted the functionality of that thing to be. So on the left, what you're seeing is uh, the first um, uh, like spatial awareness tests, we're looking at the accelerometer that we just project whether this thing knows it, whether it's up or down. Uh, and on the right hand side, just looking at you know, can we read the currently playing song off of the Wi-Fi and project that. Right? So again, just thinking about the problem, breaking it down into its component parts so that we can then pull it together into this, this bigger experience. Uh, and this is, this is Joe uh, actually pulling it all together into that, that first experience. And, You'll notice there's no camera on it yet because, again, we're trying to leave pieces of it out so that we could uh, figure out which parts would work before we um, put it all together. And so where I'm at now is uh, Android TV. So I recently moved onto the TV group. Uh, we have a current product that we're working on, but what I'm most excited about is trying to figure out what's next for Google in this space. And so what my team is going to be tasked with over the next few years is trying to figure out what does TV mean for Google uh, in the living room? So a few, a few key takeaways. Um, one, the, the role of design is, is evolving, right? It's expanding. Uh, I mentioned how I was surprised before at the number of roles that are possible for designers to go into in the user experience space. And uh, you know, our, um, our role is really changing in how we relate to our clients and how we relate to businesses. Um, we're moving from problem solving, right? Again, just taking that brief and executing on it, to problem framing, right? So how are we helping our client understand what the problem actually is? You know, we're moving from designing for, um, again, designing for a user 
to designing with users, to really bringing our end users into the equation of, of design. Um, we're moving from just designing a product to designing a system. So again, if you take time and you overlay it over the design problem, you fundamentally end up with an experience system that you have to think about those multiple touch points in which your end users may interact with your product. And finally, not just thinking about user outcomes, but thinking about business outcomes. Because more and more, as we become more valuable to businesses, we have to not just think about what we're creating for them, but how that thing is going to affect their bottom line. Uh, the second thing I want you to take away from this talk is that everybody has a story, right? Everybody should have a unique point of view. Um, I shared mine with you and how you know, my career has progressed, but everybody has a different narrative that they, they can weave through, through their work, and that's really important to remember, is that you're all unique individuals, right? And you all bring something different to the table. And don't forget that you have that unique point of view that, um, that you can bring to, to your work. Uh, and finally, you know, designers are key to making technology useful, making technology lovable, making technology easy to use, and that's the role of UX. Thank you.